Fantastic. Thank you very much. So uh, what we're going to do is hear from Dr. Heitman um, from the secondary care perspective, and then we'll uh, take some questions. Oh, the mic's still on. The mic's um, so uh, Melissa is a consultant respiratory physician at UCLH, um, working with uh, Toby, who we heard from earlier, um, who has been leading on the long COVID clinic at UCLH, um, which is obviously, as far as I'm aware, the largest long COVID clinic, um, but um, will give us the insights from the secondary care side. Thanks very much. Um, and Harsha, that was brilliant. So everything Harsha says, I, I agree with. Um, and I'm speaking today with two hats on. Partly, um, I work with the NHS England Long COVID programme as one of two um, national, national specialty advisors. So I'll tell you a bit about the plans afoot there. And uh, yeah, I'll mention our own journey at UCLH, which is really similar to what Harsha has described. And actually, I, I don't think of us as a secondary care service. I hope we've become an integrated pathway. Um, we know that COVID hasn't gone away and, and we know that long COVID hasn't gone away, but we do need to know more about what's going to happen next. And we're all waiting for the next ONS data release, which I think is due uh, next week. What's been really difficult um, from all of this data is actually knowing which of these patients who have self-reported long COVID do actually need access to an NHS uh, long COVID service. Um, and so the modelling continues to be quite challenging but we know we have a big problem. Um, and there has been ring fence funding in England since the end of 2020. And in some senses, we've, we've been ahead of the rest of the world in that regard. Um, and the long COVID plan that we were following up until March was very focused on establishing and setting up these assessment clinics and integrated rehabilitation offers um, on making sure we, we developed a self-management support offer uh, there was a little bit of funding for primary care to try and help initiate that part of the pathway uh, and uh, a, a drive to collect as much as we can in terms of data about the patients accessing clinic because this is a unique opportunity to learn about their needs. Um, funding was renewed for this financial year and we are told that there will be funding for the next financial year uh, but the modelling is going to inform exactly how that looks. And obviously today is the day that we all um, transition officially to integrated care boards, which I know we're all sort of struggling to understand what that means and what that means for all of us as providers. But um, a lot was changing at the same time, which is really challenging for us on the ground, Harsha, isn't it? So I think at least I can tell you in the NHS England programme, they are aware of that and I complain about it an awful lot. So I hope um, we'll get clarity soon. And there are 90 clinics around the country, so every, um, every person in England should be able to access referral to one in their local uh, region. And there are uh, the 14 services for children running more as a, a hub and spoke model. Um, as Harsha explained, we, we've all been on a journey with these services. I know you've seen this van before, and I do find it very weird that three of the original van members are talking to you today. So it obviously had a big impact on all of our careers. Um, but we started our clinic, um, exactly as Harsha said, as an emergency response. Really, our, our key goal was to protect our emergency department from the very high uh, readmission rate that we were seeing of patients who'd left our own hospital. But because we have a background as integrated respiratory doctors, we know all our local GPs. And from the first week, we had referrals from community managed patients. And um, extraordinarily, we have now seen 4,000 people through our service. And um, we're the lead provider for North Central London, which has a population of 1.6 million. Um, and we are a very busy clinic with about 120 appointments a week. So uh, we're really burning the candle at both ends, aren't we? Except we don't have any fun, Rebecca. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I started as a respiratory physician. I would say that I'm now a post-COVID physician because I've had to learn so much about this multi-system disease. This is not respiratory medicine, or only a little bit of it is respiratory medicine. But fortunately, most respiratory doctors are GIM accredited as well, so we're not completely useless, but we've had to do a lot of, of learning. And I think the doctor function in this could easily be a GP, um, such as Harsh with post-COVID expertise, MDT has been essential from day one, and I 
I thank my lucky stars that Rebecca turned up. She's our lead physio who's going to speak to you later on day one of the van with a clipboard. And I remember thinking, what are you doing here? You know, you need to be on the wards. But actually it was like, oh my goodness, we really needed her. And, and she brought in all the other therapists that we've come to realize are important to our patients. Um, and then multi-specialties. So we've been lucky with cardiology and neurology feeding into our model particularly, and then all the old, other ologies as well. Um, we are trying to co-design our pathway with patients um, and patient voice has always led the way in the long COVID space and they've been an important driver. Uh, we've all now had our personalised care training and that's been really very helpful in improving our consultation skills and identifying what's important to that individual as Harsha was describing. Um, and we've been working closely with our GPs and our community providers so that we really hope that we don't act as an ivory tower in our pathway, um, that we're acting on the interface with all the other providers uh, who we work with. So um, at the top is our Islington um, Borough MDT and the same sort of professionals that Harsha mentioned. Uh, we, we need all of their input. And then we also have a weekly multi-specialty MDT uh, at UCH. So we're actually running five MDTs a week and it's helped us learn about the condition, avoid siloed thinking, um, really thinking about research that's required in this patient group, because that's also extremely important. In terms of the NHS England position, um, there is about to be published an update on the long COVID plan, identifying the, the key areas of focus for improving long COVID services going into the next few years. Um, and these are some of the themes that will be covered in that. So really knowing, understanding what does good look like in, in long COVID services? You know, what are the best outcomes we can achieve? Uh, what outcomes should we be monitoring? Um, and how are different models around the country achieving outcomes? You know, how can we drive a more consistent approach and what should that consistent approach look like? Um, looking at patient experience in the different services from the friends and family test, and there's more research going on about patient experience because we know it's been really challenging for many individuals. Um, improving the Your COVID Recovery resource, which started off with quite a post-hospital focus, and, and there was a real need to make that more broadly um, useful and a huge amount of work's being done and it's being updated uh, very often at the moment. So I hope you'll see that that's, that content's more useful to you. Um, the modelling I've talked about, widening access, so a lot of work going on in different regions about proactive case finding. We do not get referrals with patients with learning difficulties. I've never seen anybody from a prison, you know, um, and we have concerns that patients from deprived backgrounds are not accessing the pathway. So we need work on the ground to understand how do we unblock that problem. Um, I think we've got all the theory we need now, but, but we actually need some case studies. Um, capacity has been a challenge from the start and um, we're going to be encouraging a, a process of triage on receipt of referrals so that you prioritise referrals appropriately and direct them to the right part of the pathway and maximise the capacity, trying to get rid of those um, weights above 15 weeks, which are a real problem uh, for many of us. Um, we're developing some resources for training post-COVID clinicians because we've done so much learning and we now need to extract our expertise from our heads uh, and our MDTs and, and, and share it somewhere. And the skills transference in this field has been one of the really lovely things, hasn't it? Um, and we do need to continue to support primary care who are under so much pressure at the moment. Um, a long COVID toolkit has been developed with the RCGP, um, but I think finding ways within all of our own pathways to really help primary care with this um, is, is, remains very important. Lots of brilliant research is going on, I think relevant to post-COVID services, the Stimulate ICP study and the locomotion study are particularly of interest to us. Um, so the former is a, uh, including evaluation of diagnostics, medicines and digital um, supported uh, rehabilitation. And the locomotion study is trying to define what a gold standard pathway would look like. As Harsha said, referrals have been steady um, and we've seen an increasing requirement to, for follow-up. That's looking at this, um, I don't know if my point is working, but the, the graph top left. Um, and we just do see that, uh, that people from least uh, most deprived backgrounds are slightly underrepresented. And for us, we've had, found the public health data looking borough by borough really, really helpful. So for example, I know in Haringey that the people from deprived backgrounds are not 
as likely to be coded by their GP as having long COVID or post COVID syndrome as it should be known in a coding sense. Um, and I can see that in Camden, the referral rate by primary care network is, is unexpectedly varying, especially as some of these PCNs are literally overlook our, our hospital where we're based. So uh, this, is, um, this is where we need to focus our attention on this unwarranted variation. We've moved in the last week really to a different referral process in North Central London, um, where we now have a single point of access. We're trying to make it easier for GPs to know who to refer to and save too much primary care time in doing an assessment and increase the consistency in our approach to decision-making about access to the pathway. We also use a self-assessment tool, which is done via an online patient portal, which has been really useful. Um, and the other good thing about the single point of access is it overcomes some of the digital barriers we face in taking referrals from five boroughs. Um, we've simplified our primary care template for assessment on EMIS, um, and it auto populates a referral form. GPs told us that what we developed to start with is far too complicated, and it was very much a reflection of what we were doing within the clinic, but no one else really understood long COVID at the time, and it was too hard for them. Um, and we've now recruited a GP lead for each borough in North Central London to advocate for the pathway, attend community MDTs and outreach to practices that aren't using the pathway properly, or I shouldn't say properly, or optimally, um, so that we can really try and even up uh, that access um, as we're quite worried about that. And they will look very jolly on this um, Teams meeting, so I, I think they're very happy in their work. <laughs> um, one of the, the key things we've been learning about over the last two years is how to match the offer to the patient need. Uh, I don't think all patients with an, in the ONS survey, for example, need referral to a post-COVID service. Um, and so with that lower complexity need, uh, they can be well supported by their GP with self-management um, support. Then there are others who need more input for their recovery, um, but may not have red flags requiring a sort of uh, increased doctor assessment and they may be suitable for the therapy-led post-COVID rehab and we've got um, four borough-based teams delivering that uh, multifaceted rehab offer. Um, but what has been surprising to us is that, like Harsha said, a, a good proportion of people really do need to see a doctor with post-COVID expertise um, and what we hope is that with this pathway we flip the pyramid horizontally to try and create this integrated model so that people can transition between the sort of doctor overseeing component and the therapy led component, trying to reduce multiple appointments, multiple onward referrals, you know, trying to wrap the care around the patient as much as possible. And I know it's easy to say these words and it's very hard to deliver them, but that's definitely what we're always trying to do. And um, we drew this Venn diagram probably sort of by a year in, we'd added all our, our blobs of the, the different components of a long COVID presentation. You know, certainly long COVID is not the same as POTS. It's not just POTS. One in five of our patients has um, exertional tachycardia or inappropriate sinus tachycardia. And one in five of them we're doing a halter on, but there's, there'll be other people we see where, we, where you don't have POTS. And I think what's so challenging in this field is being able to identify all the components you need to from that one assessment. Um, and our assessment is an hour long, so 30 minutes for the doctor and 30 minutes for the physio. And there's a lot to do in that time. So um, this is Rachel, who is one of our OTs. As I said, you know, we have a sort of in-person first assessment. One of the key jobs is to make sure we're comfortable with the diagnosis. We found that one in 20 people referred to us has another. Uh, diagnosis which uh, accounts for their symptoms and sometimes quite severe uh, other, other pathology identified. Uh, we're trying to think about biomarkers all the time. We've definitely not cracked that. We see things of interest. We're pursuing uh, questions about the, the microclotting, which I think has been very inflammatory, what's been published so far, and we're trying to understand that. We're asking questions about mitochondrial function, about autoimmunity, um, and, and that's all very fascinating, but it remains uh, incomplete. So I don't have any uh, big you know, announcement to make that we understand what long COVID is. Um, we find a simple exercise test and the active lean test very helpful. We try to do some simple same day diagnostics 
um, and then decide on more advanced tests just depending on clinical judgment. Um, and then we use the uh, assessment tool to track their ongoing progress. Um, and many services are finding the Yorkshire Rehab Screening Tool useful for that. I think you know there's a, a few different tools in use around the country, which I, I think is healthy so that we can compare and pick out the best, best aspects of all of those. And then the multifaceted rehab, there's been a lot of healthy debate about the right approach to rehabilitation for this patient group. And as Harsha said, the key thing is that it's it, that what your program remains completely bespoke to that individual because people are at different points in the trajectory of recovery. Their long COVID might be affecting them in a different way. We've got into lots of arguments about whether they should be doing exercise or whether the focus should be doing on be on pacing. And of course, that really depends on where that individual is in their recovery and, and how they're affected. So that's one of the real skills of the post-COVID rehab teams in that they're increasingly able to match the model to what that individual needs. Um, and Rebecca will talk to you a bit about how important it is that we measure the outcomes from rehabilitation and we, we reassure ourselves that we are actually seeing improvement. And through the NHS England programme, we've been able to capture reports from um, many services around the country, which are really proving that they are helping with patient recovery. And we need to... Um, really speak strongly, I think, to that message that proactive support improves the outcome of patients and that this is work that's worth doing. And that is the end. I didn't need to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> So we've now got time for a couple of questions. Is there anyone in the audience? I'm looking, we've got a hand up there. So, um, so I'm going to take, we've got one right in the middle at the back. So if you want to have a, a cheeky run. And whilst we're doing that, just to let you know, there's been a flurry of discussion online, um, partly to do with access to services, uh, which I'm sure you're, you're used to, and the variability. And whilst we're getting there, there was something, there was a question that came in saying, um, is everyone working to the same pathway? And if so, where is it and how can they find it? Yeah, so I think the best source of what we're trying to work to is the commissioning guidance. Yeah. And that is being updated and due to be released in the next one to two weeks. So watch this space type. And thing. it will speak strongly to that need to improve consistency of offer and of the core elements that a post-COVID service must include. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Because there's a lot of discussion. Oh which yeah. Is always with, yeah. which I'm sure you're not. Uh, you're not no, and it's by. it's it's true. There is an unwarranted variation. Yeah in access and approach. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. So we've got time for one in the room as well. And that's uh, you there, honey. You? Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, I thought it looks like I'm pointing at you. Um, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for, for, the, for the talks. Um, I'm I think the mic's not on. There's a little button on the side, make it go green. Yeah, no, press the side. Well, Maybe try the other mic. I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. shout and we'll repeat it so that online. Yeah. Um, I'm just interested in the group that I've potentially represented, like so the elderly, but I'm just interested in the um, minority ethnic groups. So the last time I looked at the onus uh, stats, and that was admittedly a number of weeks ago, um, it seemed to suggest that people of Caucasian ethnicity were more likely to self-report long COVID than people of minority ethnic groups. And I'm just interested to know, is that is that still the case? And if so, what what might explain that? Yeah, so I think I think that is the case, but it really varies around the country. So in our own patch, for example, the ethnicity of patients referred to the clinic exactly matches that of our local population. But we had thought that COVID had a high prevalence in ethnic minority groups, so they may still be underrepresented. And I think that remains a really important focus. Um, we, you know, we would love to improve the quality of the ethnicity data in the NHS England registry. And I think one of the great things every service can do is ensure they're documenting that accurately. So I agree, it's one of the, the key areas of focus. <laughs> 